going to be discussing federalism, specifically trying to understand really how this works and how this differs from other systems and how the Constitution outlines how federalism should work in the United States. So we have to think of why federalism? Why did we choose this particular type of government? What was its purpose? And how did it differ from the other ways and organization we could have chosen? So we know that in class we have discussed a couple of different things. A unitary a unitary type of government, which remember a unitary government, the power is going to be specifically with your central government because that's where the power is going to come from. They're going to really rule it out and really they're going to have the final say. And they can really tell what local governments are allowed to do. The other kind that we have seen uh, twice in the United States, once really officially and once, of course, during the uh, Civil War, which is a confederate. And a confederate is basically your power is going to be with local governments. And that local government is going to be the one that dictates where the power should be, what power should be given to the central government, and really can decide whether or not they want to adhere to it. Um, the current example of a confederacy is going to be the EU. And that is because they've really, all these independent sovereign nations have gotten together to give authority to the EU organization, looking at free trade, um, stabilizing their financial currency with the Euro, and things like that. And of course, we can see with their uh, voluntary participation and such, you have uh, Brexit with uh, the UK's exit from the EU uh, most recently. An example of unitary is, of course, the UK. Um, their parliament is their central government, has most of the um, authoritative um, power within their con their governing body. And so their local governments exist and they do operate, but really they all really have to be dictated what the powers they can do by what the central government gives them. So. In our federalism, when we look at why did the framers choose that, um, we're looking at the idea of limiting the government. We wanted a stronger central government. So when we look a little bit further, um, these experiences kind of is what we're looking at. So as I kind of looked at, you have, of course, um, the idea that the government can pose a threat. We do not want a central government that can overrule our individual liberties. So we wanted to limit them just a little bit. You have, of course, the government to exercise um, power, but that it needed to be restrained. Um, they wanted to make sure that it can overreach uh, what people thought was the necessary things that a government should be responsible of, and they didn't want them to have the ability to take too much power upon themselves to, over time, become too powerful. And of course, they really wanted to curb um, and prevent that. So they felt federalism was the best way to just kind of anticipate that over time a government could become too powerful, if not limited, and they wanted to curb and prevent its abuse. So what it really means when you look at the idea of federalism, you have a system of government in which you have specific powers that are divided. So a division of power. That means that you are going to have some powers given to a central, national, or federal government, which will what I'd be kind of referring to it as. And then of course you have the regional governments. In our situation, we have states um, in which we have that. And then of course we have local provinces or organizations. Um, and we'll look at that um, hierarchy of power a little bit later in our lesson today. So the constitution specifically looks at the division and that's white and it doesn't really show up that great. Um, which means that there are certain things that the national government can do and certain things that the states can do. And of course, there's also things that are specifically denied. So in that division, there was a concrete way and some clarity of language um, that at least allowed for those things to be upheld and substantiated. So with the national government, they are called delegated powers. And there's a few more names that they have, but that delegated is really important. That means that the constitution literally spells out specifically a specific thing that the uh, federal government can do um, that is delegated to them. When you have a task or a job, or you know, you're in charge of someone, you have a little sister or a little brother and you, you know, you're given a chore and you delegate that chore to them, you give put that, uh, specific responsibility on them, that's delegating it. That's giving it to somebody else. Um, so when we say that the constitution delegates these powers to the national government, we're saying the constitution said, you are the one that does this. Um, so they're ones that are granted to the federal government. So when we look at all of the, what we would consider that comes under this definition of delegated, you're going to find um, expressed. Those are things that are directly in the constitution. When you express something, you're verbally saying it. You're being very specific. You have implied. 
And that is something that might not specifically be stated in the Constitution, but kind of is comes under and is reasonably suggested. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the next slide in just a second. And you have inherent. Um, inherent is kind of something that comes naturally, something that is uh, just makes sense. Um, when you think of the federal government helping the United States deal with the world community, it makes sense that you just have one entity that is talking for the whole United States, not 50 different entities trying to handle 50 different agendas, but just one that is the spokesperson, the manifester of our relationship with the global community. And so it might not say in the Constitution specifically that they can do that, but it makes sense because they're the national government. They're speaking for the, the, the United States. So the implied idea. So we say reasonably improper. So in the constitution, our framers were pretty darn smart and knew that the world would not be the same as it progressed, evolved, and kind of transitioned uh, from 1789. And that is that they entered this little necessary proper clause. And this is what it says, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all powers vested by this constitution in the government of the United States or in any department of officer thereof. Hmm pretty, pretty vague. It really is. And people are kind of, uh, this was not a good thing with the anti-federalists. They're like, uh, you want to leave that nice little vagueness in there? That's going to mean that the government's just going to take a whole bunch of powers. But the federalists, you know, the ones who thought the, the constitution was good, they looked at this and at this, the necessary and proper idea as is of course, within reason, it doesn't mean that they can just do anything. It has to of course be tied or in connection with the other powers that are vested. So it does have to be reasonably connected to the powers that are already specific or um, what we would consider expressed or inherent to the federal government. They can't take any of the powers that are specifically reserved for the states, and we'll talk about what that word means, and they can't go changing what those things are. So their power is still restricted and still can't be overreached, but it has given Congress and the federal government some leeway as times have progressed. You have war times, you have uh, new inventions, you have different progressions within society and different changes that have allowed the federal government to take on these responsibilities and keep the 50 states connected. Um, just as a Supreme Court kind of connection to this, um, we definitely have um, many cases in which you have the specifically McCullough versus uh, Maryland, which is a key case and one of the first cases that the Supreme Court heard. And we'll talk about uh, this case and its additional significance when we talk about the judicial branch. But he wrote that this provision is intended to help the constitution endure and adapt for ages to come. Because there are things we cannot always anticipate that our country is going to go through, that our federal government might, might need to be the ones responsible for taking care of and for mandating. Um, let's take for instance, patents and copyrights. In 1789, the internet wasn't even a blip. It was not not even fathomable to the framers of the Constitution. So how do you anticipate a Congress to regulate the internet and this World Wide Web and its access to all 50 states when they don't even know it's going to exist? So we couldn't just rely on the Constitution. <clears throat> Excuse me. We couldn't just rely on the framers to literally start listing out every single Thing that they could think of that would possibly come up for the Congress to have to deal with. So they really needed to be able to anticipate that changes and evolves would happen. So um, Marshall continues, uh, Judge Marshall continues to say, these are important for the future for our Congress to continue having efficient um, delegation um, and regulation of the United States as they develop. So we knew that the framers couldn't literally spell up everything. So this little phrase, even though it can seem problematic to some, especially early on with the anti-federalists, really helped pinpoint what was important um, so that they can continue to adapt. So as we said, the federal government can't do everything. We wanted to limit them. So we have to deny them certain powers that they can't do. So we have like exports. So remember, exports are things that are going outside of our country, not inside which is if it's going inside our country, then it's an import. So we regulate those because, well, we want people to buy American made products, right? And because we want people to buy American made products, we don't want the constitution, like the federal government to put taxes on them because that would discourage other countries from buying our exports. So that would be bad. Of course, we have the protections of freedom of speech and those things in the amendments. You have, of course, the press, and that's a big one. 
to regulate the press is meaning that the government is going to have control of what information gets to the people. And so that's been a kind of a big thing recently. And we're going to continue to talk about that later. The idea that we can assemble, we can protest. Um, government can't regulate those, at least can't prohibit them. There's regulations on certain things, making sure that people are protected. And that's the idea of the government. That's their job. Um, we also have specific things that are listed in the Constitution. Um, and those things are here. And um, like it literally says, Congress cannot. Congress shall not. Congress will not. The language is very specific. But if it's something that is silent on the issue, um, well, the Tenth Amendment, you have one that basically a lot of people do not pay attention to. Um, it basically says, you know, we're delegating things that are not talked about in the Constitution and so forth to the people and to the states. So because the Constitution is silent, the Congress, you know, and federal government can't just be like, oh, well, I can, we can do this. Well, no, that's, that's the whole point of the Constitution, to limit you. Um, and there is, of course, um, that makes it so that things that are not stated in the Constitution end up being reserved. Because again, you can't list out everything, so. And I'll define reserved in just a second. 